Jacques Derrida, who passed away in 2004, was a French philosopher and one of the most influential thinkers of his era. Here he's relaxing in his Parisian home with Logos, his cat. In the last years of his life, he focused on animal rights, and his position on the issues was published posthumously in The Animal That Therefore I Am. He opens his treatise with a charming story. He's in his bathroom when he notices that his little cat is staring at his naked body. He's embarrassed. He's automatically assumed that the cat has consciousness, is scrutinizing his nakedness, and he ruminates over why he feels this way, dwells on this as a segue into a critical analysis of the inequitable relations of power between human and non-human animals. This West Coast jetty is home to a colony of feral cats. For over half a century, the jetty has been a dumping ground for unwanted cats and kittens. So most of these cats are descendants of generations of cats that have adjusted to life among these boulders. Through the efforts of a succession of caring people who've brought them food and fresh water, the jetty cats survive. The colony is also monitored by local organizations that manage the cat's well-being and control their population through the trap, neuter, and return method. This approach is increasingly practiced throughout the globe, in contrast to the other way of dealing with feral cats, which is to trap and euthanize them. From time to time, interest in and issues over the jetty cats arise and make the local papers and news broadcasts. New tonight, a colony of cats abandoned by their owners has taken over a jetty living on the rocks. The county says there is nothing it can do about it, but neighbors are taking action. I think the jetty cats are great, and I would be surprised if California would do anything to hurt them. I expect more from Californians. <laughs> I think they should keep them. <laughs> they're really cute. And they're not hurting anybody. I've been coming here for almost like a year now and I see a lot of ki uh, cats and a lot of people coming in and taking care of them, giving them food, you know, playing with them. Some of them are really friendly, some of them still like they're afraid of people they're not used to, you know. So, but I enjoy coming here. Every time I come here, I get, bring them like dry food and some tuna fish. Some of them are really fat and healthy. Barring any major developments in the area or trap and euthanize campaigns, the jetty cats are fine for now. Throughout the following, we'll look in on them at various times of the day and during different seasons. We'll see how they're cared for, what impact the modern animal rights movement is having on their status and well-being. And we'll hear from visitors, caregivers, activists, and professionals. Humans were nomadic hunter-gatherers until about 10,000 years ago, when they began to settle into agriculturally-based societies that grew and stored such crops as wheat, oats, and barley. Some of the earliest archaeological evidence of this transformation is found in the ruins of the ancient civilizations of the Fertile Crescent. This is a wildcat, descended from a lineage that has roamed the Middle East and North Africa for over 100,000 years. They live off of small animals and, like their ancestors, are drawn near people to hunt around food storage areas and trash heaps for mice and rats. In the early 2000s, archaeologists discovered an almost 12,000-year-old site on Cyprus in which a man had been buried with a wild cat. Tools and decorative stones and shells were arranged around the man and the cat in a ceremonial pattern to indicate that they shared a special relationship. Since wild cats were not indigenous to Cyprus, they must have been transported to the island by sea from the surrounding mainlands. The science isn't clear yet, 
but it's assumed that the ancient farmers appreciated the vermin-reducing services that wildcats provided. So they captured wild kittens, bred those that were most docile and skilled at hunting, and through thousands of years, the wildcat evolved into the domestic cat. Representations of cats began to appear around 3000 BCE on the Isles of Crete and Cyprus, in Asia, among pre-Columbian cultures in the Western Hemisphere, and in Egypt. The ancient Romans also appreciated domestic cats and brought them to Europe from their outlying colonies. But with the decline of the Roman Empire came the Dark Ages and the decline in society's attitudes towards cats. It was believed that the devil appeared in the form of a black cat during satanic rituals. And by the 13th century, two popes had declared that cats were evil, diabolical creatures. There's some evidence of the systematic killings of cats in various parts of Europe. And this corresponds with the witch hunts, in which hundreds of thousands were accused of practicing black magic and burned alive at the stake. Poor single women, who had to eke out a living as midwives and folk healers, were ostracized by medieval society and targeted by witch hunters. They must have led lonely lives. They would have found comfort in cats as helpful companion animals who fed themselves while ridding the house and yard of rodents. Countless women accused of being witches were killed with their pet cats. During the Dark Ages, cats were also blamed for spreading the bubonic plague, when in actuality it was the fleas on rodents that carried the disease. There's a theory that as cats were exterminated, the rodent population exploded and the Black Death spread wider. By the mid-14th century, a hundred million people had perished from the plague in Europe. Outbreaks of the plague, witch hunts, and the killing of cats continued into the early 1700s. But the aristocracy, removed from much of the disease and turmoil, did keep pet cats, and they were pampered fixtures in some of Europe's grandest royal courts. By the mid-1700s, with advances in science, medicine, and hygiene, outbreaks of the plague diminished. And with more education and higher rates of literacy, superstitions diminished as well. Europe entered a period of enlightenment in which the philosophical foundations for modern human rights, as well as modern animal rights, were established. Queen Victoria, who reigned from 1837 to 1901 as the British Empire grew into a major industrial power, was a highly influential cultural icon whose tastes and styles were emulated throughout the Western world. Victoria loved animals, and especially cats. White Persians were her favorite. She supported the anti-vivisection movement of the era and insisted that a cat be included in the design for the Royal Society Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Queen's Medal of Kindness. She was adamant that something be done about the general aversion to cats, which, she declared, were misunderstood and grossly ill-treated. Domestic cats were back in favor, and people took an interest in different breeds of cats, in defining and establishing their ideal characteristics, and in maintaining their bloodlines. Early European colonists had brought cats to the Western Hemisphere, and by the turn of the 20th century, the United States was populated by millions of domestic cats. Homeless feral cats roamed towns, cities, and countryside, and formed colonies. The great majority of pet cats lived outside and were perhaps allowed into the home for visits. There's American folk sayings and representations that make reference to putting the cat out for the night. Bang your with the Flintstones, we'll have a yabba dabba do time, yabba dabba do time, we'll have a gay old time. It wasn't until about 50 years ago that people began to keep their pet cats permanently indoors. 
This corresponded with a growing public awareness about good pet care, the greater availability of commercial cat food and litter, and ever-increasing attention to stricter municipal management, including animal control. By the 1970s, free-roaming cats and feral cat colonies took on greater visibility throughout the United States. They were stigmatized as a nuisance, unclean, and a threat to public health. Many, many millions of cats were trapped and killed. It was at this time that a revival in the modern animal rights movement occurred. Professional activists and grassroots organizations were instrumental in implementing stronger animal protection laws and policies. Individuals and groups began specifically advocating for feral cats, and within a decade, they had established the trap, neuter, and return method for managing their health and population. In other parts of the world, the history of domestic cats differs from their history in Western societies in some ways and corresponds in others. There is, however, a growing global-wide movement to provide better care for domestic cats in general, whether housebound, free-roaming, or in feral colonies. Jeremy Bentham was a 19th century English philosopher who contributed to humanist discourses through his principles of utilitarianism, that human action is right if it increases the happiness, pleasure, and good of the greatest number of people. When the issue arose as to whether this ideal applies to non-human animals, Bentham responded with his now famous declaration, the question is not, can they reason? nor can they talk, but can they suffer. For Bentham, it is the capacity for suffering that is the essential criteria that entitles non-human animals to equal moral and ethical consideration. With industrialization, solidifying capitalism, and imperial expansion, the 1800s were a time of great transformation for Europe and the United States. It was also an era of great contradictions. The European Enlightenment had established that all humans are equal and have the right to liberty and justice. However, Western powers continued to colonize and enslave people throughout the world and deny rights to children, women, workers, and people of color. At the same time, as modern cities developed and expanded, it was recognized that there was a need to control the large populations of dogs and cats that roamed the streets. Yet the institutions established became primarily kill houses for captured animals. Hey, bud, you can't get that dog in. Can I? Now. 
You're too late. He's dead by now. In response, the 1800s also saw the emergence of social movements and organizations to secure and protect human rights for all people, and for the rights of non-human animals as well, including anti-vivisection campaigns and various animal protection societies. Progress was steady. Freedom, rights, and protections were expanded. Then, the issues were eclipsed in the early 20th century with the outbreak of the Great War, followed by the Great Depression, the rise of fascism, and World War II. In the United States, it wasn't until the 1950s and the revolutionary 1960s that civil rights movements emerged again with renewed commitment. This included a reinvigoration of the modern animal rights movement, marked by the 1975 publication of Peter Singer's Animal Liberation. Singer anchors his argument in the concept of speciesism. The fact that animals are not human, that they belong to a different species, isn't a reason for giving less consideration to their interests. And he expands upon Jeremy Bentham's utilitarianism in affirming that, yes, animals are different than humans, but because animals do suffer, they are entitled to equal consideration and treatment. In addition to fresh philosophical contributions to the ideals of modern animal rights, were on the ground actions and interventions by animal rights activists, such as Rich Avanzino, the father of the no-kill movement for shelter animals. Rich Avanzino's doctor of pharmacy degree from the University of California, San Francisco, and his law degree from UC Davis, and importantly, his love of animals, well prepared him for his appointment as the president of San Francisco's Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals in 1976. He implemented the no-kill policy and established the nation's first adoption guarantee for every healthy shelter animal. Here, Rich Avanzino discusses the no-kill movement. The no-kill agenda, as I understand it, that I'm committed to, that I believe is possible, is where we have a community-wide adoption guarantee. A country that basically says to the dogs and cats of this, this nation that your life will not be taken unless you have an incurable, painful condition that cannot be reversed, or you're a public health uh, danger you have rabies or you have some other things that poses a risk to the well-being of our country. Except in those very extraordinary circumstances, all the dogs and cats of America deserve a loving home. The statistics are quite impressive. 84% of Americans who have pets in their households believe that they're family members. Family members are not killed as a management strategy. The killing of dogs and cats as a way of controlling what some people perceive to be a surplus or oversupply is a tragedy. The fact that it's been condoned by the humane movement is outrageous. If there ever was a time where that had justification, it's not now. There is no reason for a dog and cat to be killed in an animal shelter at this point in time. 17 million people are going to be adopting a pet this year, and they haven't decided where. If we can convince 2.3 million of those 17 million to go to a shelter or rescue, we can have a no-kill nation. We can guarantee that all the dogs and cats of America have a loving home. There's no reason why we can't provide that guarantee now. And it's a tragedy that it hasn't happened before this time. And it was a specific controversy that occurred in 1980 that greatly raised national awareness to the plight of many millions of animals that were being killed in shelters every year. Rich Avanzino's fight to save Saito's life. Well, you could call it dog determination. It took action by the state legislature and a probate judge, but Saito lives. Bernard Goldberg reports from San Francisco. She may look like a dog, but officially, Saito is a piece of property. And when her owner, an elderly woman, died six months ago, her will revealed that she wanted Saito put to death, worrying the dog wouldn't receive proper care without her. 
But the head of the local humane society took the dog home with him and said dogs were not property, that dogs had rights too. This is a dog who at 11 years old entered uh, the San Francisco SPC shelter because her owner committed suicide and left a will saying that her pet should be euthanized and buried with her. Well, we didn't believe at that point in time, I'd only been with the organization for three years, but we believed that every dog and cat deserved a home. Our peer group believed that any animal over five years old, any pet that wasn't acute and cuddly, anything that wasn't considered low-hanging fruit, should have their lives immediately taken. Well, because we disagreed, we wouldn't let the executor carry out the will. And I got sued, and the San Francisco SPCA got sued. Then legislation was passed to save her life. The national organizations opposed the legislation, thinking that if somebody wanted to have their animal killed at the time of their death, that that was justifiable because, heck, all these animals were dying, and if somebody wanted to have their pet die with them, what's the harm? Well, Saito thought that that was not the right thing to do. She had a lot of life to live. And she became the poster child, I think, for the no-kill movement. There is no justification for her life to be taken. She's committed no crime. The only crime that she committed was that she loved totally her master. And for that, she's been condemned to die. They even went to the state capitol, lobbied for a pardon. The governor signed the bill last night. But official word did not reach the judge who was to decide if Saito would live or die. Avanzino, wearing his favorite dog tie to court today, had already made up his mind. <laughs> that dog's life will not be taken under any circumstances, with or without a favorable ruling. Inside the courtroom, the dog's attorneys beg the court. Your Honor, Saito is a dog, and her life is all she has. Judge Fotenhauer, whose name translates to paw slapper from the German, was about to rule when formal word came from the governor's office that the law had indeed passed. The judge, for the record, issued his verdict. Saito would live, putting a collar on the execution. Saito, a 10-year-old part collie, part sheepdog, got the word outside the courtroom. She was speechless that she had been spared a premature trip to the big kennel in the sky. Well, I, we're just excited. And you can tell that Saito's excited, too. Every day, a story was being told about her. People would come over with their cameras to do the interviews to basically find out what was her life like. We would go to the park and throw a ball and have her fetch and chase and, and bring it back. And she acted like she was just two years old. She was adorable. She was a dream. She was by my side for five years, never more than five feet away. Saito changed the world because 3,000 people stepped forward to basically say, even though this is an old dog, we will want to save her life. That proved to me that the American people, if they had a chance to be introduced to the qualities, the talents, and the love that these animals have in our lives, they're not going to let them die. They're going to be there to rescue them. They're going to be there to take them home. They're going to be there to provide the love and affection that they so richly deserve. Trap, neuter, and return is a method of dealing with feral, 
free roaming, and community cats in a way that manages their health, controls their population, and allows them to live out and enjoy their natural lives. It's supported by such animal care and rights organizations as Maddie's Fund, a foundation dedicated to the goal of achieving a no-kill nation where all healthy and treatable shelter dogs and cats are guaranteed a loving home. Dr. Julie Levy, veterinarian, professor, and co-founder of the Maddie's Shelter Medicine Program at the University of Florida, explains the humane benefits of the trap-neuter-return method. We certainly would love to get most of the cats that are adoptable into homes, that's always the best outcome for cats that are socialized. But we know that there's a large number of cats that either don't want to live in homes because they're unsocialized or there may currently just not be enough homes for all of those cats. So when we see these cats that are happily enjoying each other outside and are clearly fat and fluffy and thriving, we we wouldn't want to have an instinct that the best thing we could do is remove them and euthanize them at the local animal shelter. It's really much more respectful for them to help them continue to enjoy this happy lifestyle that they have. This is a picture that was sent to me by one of our colony caregivers in Gainesville, and I think it shows how happily cats can live in TNR programs in their communities. And these cats, even though they cannot be touched, have loving caregivers that are very concerned about them, have named them, even though they can't tell the black cats apart. They're passionately protective and affectionate towards these cats. And this really is the greatest sign of respect for these animals, helping them find the best way to live safely. So I was running down this jetty last weekend actually and I've never run down this jetty before but I was running and I saw the bowls of water on the ground for the cats and they said for the cats and I was like there's there's no way there's cats out here and then I just started seeing cat after cat after cat and I realized that they have their own little colony out here and Cats of all different kinds, all different colors, all different sizes. Some are friendly, some stay away. Uh, but I really like the fact that they're able to actually live wild lives out here. That they are, they're being fed, they have water, but they're also kind of doing their own thing. And they're able to do that with the help of all the volunteers and, you know, people making sure that they're not breeding again and again and again or interbreeding. and. I think it's really awesome that they're able to live out their little ocean fantasy out here. After his tenure as president of the San Francisco SPCA, Rich Avanzino became president of Maddie's Fund in 1999, in which he directed substantial funds towards the goal of a no-kill nation for companion animals. Since his retirement in 2015, he serves as the foundation's strategic advisor. Here he tells about San Francisco SPCA's early experiences in developing their trap, neuter, and return program. I first came to know about the feral cat colonies of San Francisco when GGNRA, the Golden Gate National Recreation Department of the federal government, tried to ban them. They wanted to go out and basically destroy the habitats that had been built by the feral cat colony caregivers and, the, and stop them from feeding, arresting them basically. Well. This was against anything that I could believe in, and we decided to fight the GGNRA, and the cat colony caregivers rallied to their defense, and we changed the federal policy in San Francisco in trying to trap and kill outdoor cats. But it didn't stop there. The feral cat colony caregivers, long before I arrived on the scene, had already been the not only the stewards and the champion, but the the rescuers of the cats. So when the cats would get sick, they would take them to a veterinarian. If the cats needed to be spayed or neutered, they would have them altered. But they did it all on their own, and they did it one at a time with doctors that they were able to encourage to provide them either a discount or to do it for free. So there was no institutional care uh, for the outdoor cat colonies. San Francisco SPCA started a spay-neuter clinic uh, right when I got there, we thought it was the right thing to do. It was 
considered uh, minority thinking at the time. Uh, people thought it was a silly exercise and a waste of money. But we started a, a, a spay-neuter clinic. And then when the feral cat colony people approached us, we said, yes, let's do this. So we then opened up our, our spay-neuter clinic for TNR seven days a week. And we moved from the TNR program to actually paying senior citizens $10 to go out and steal cats from people's backyards and bring them to us so we would spay and neuter them. Now this is illegal in San Francisco, but as an attorney I had a personal ambition of either suing or being sued every six weeks. And so I thought this was a wonderful opportunity to get myself sued by doing something outrageous as fixing free roaming cats. Nobody ever sued me. But I was waiting for the opportunity to talk about how irresponsible it was to have free roaming cats unfixed going around our city, adding to an additional oversupply. But TNR became very robust in our city and throughout the rest of the country. Audrey Stratton worked in the animal shelter world and in animal medicine, and she is now a director of the local feral cat coalition that cares for the jetty cats. Eight years ago, she was walking her dog when she discovered that the jetty was overrun with cats and kittens, 83 according to her count at the time. She recognized that there was an immediate need. She got the county and the feral cat coalition involved and established a trap neuter return program to care for and manage the jetty cats. She's also among a number of people who bring food and fresh water to the jetty on a regular basis. I met her late one windy afternoon to talk about the cats. And that's walking towards us right now, that's Donna Karen. Diva, that's why her name's Diva, she's such a brat. <laughs> but the fluffy one here is Donna Karen. She's a real old cat. She's been here for a really long time and feeders have been feeding this colony for I think over 40 years so you know I'm not the first person to discover these kitties. Yeah that's what I was going to ask you how uh, long the colony has been here. There's uh, people in the area that you know come upon the Facebook page there are you know older gentlemen that say I used to go fishing there when I was a boy and there there's always been cats there and and that's how it wound up to 85 cats you know the uh -huh. the people before me were really you know caring and fed them but they weren't looking at the long-term solution which was TNR and now you know six years later we're down to about 32 cats I think uh -huh. so it it works TNR works a week later, I met Audrey again at this nondescript commercial building in a nearby neighborhood where the Feral Cat Coalition holds its spay-neuter clinic. All of the staff are volunteers, including the veterinarian, and besides spaying and neutering captured feral cats that are then returned to their home territories, the clinic provides low-cost sterilization for pet cats. So the cats will get dropped off here. Um, we, come, we check them all in. Every cat gets a tag where we write um, its description, the trapper's initials, and then that's all we write at that time. They'll go into anesthesia which is through this door here. This is where the cats uh, get anesthetized. They'll come out here and get a weight and the rest of their tag gets filled out. Um, with how much we've used. And from anesthesia, come on out. This is where we express the cat's bladders um, so they don't urinate during surgery. And after that, they'll come over to this table where we'll prep them. We'll get them all shaved and scrubbed up and ready for surgery. And so we don't use, um, you know, full gas machines. They just get injections of anesthetics. So this is where our females get spayed. Got some nice classical music while they're getting. <laughs> Okay. So kitties also come in with wounds um, from fighting or, you know, climbing yeah. fences. And mm -hmm. this is the only time a cat's going to see a vet in its life that's feral. So we look at their toes, look in their mouths, look over their bodies, 
and this kitty's gotten in a couple fights with other kitties probably, so we gave it a convenient injection, which is a 10-day um, antibiotic instead of giving them pills because you can't really put a feral cat to give them these injections. This is actually, we weighed this cat, he's 17 pounds. He's one of the biggest cats we've ever had in our clinic. So beautiful. He's a big guy. So and he's, he's waking up. <laughs> yeah. So you can't wake up waking up. But here, this is where they get groomed. Um, we get the fleas out as best as we can. We try to get any mats out. They get their ears cleaned out. Um, just a nice brushing job. Unless they wake up, then they <laughs> we do what we can as quickly as we can and get them back into their traps. This is our little recovery area where all the kitties keep each other warm. Um, we have little warmers here and we also have heating pads under this whole table. So this is where our volunteers monitor their breathing um, and see, just wait for them to wake up. And as soon as they're showing signs that they're awake by, you know, moving their toes and their head, they'll put them in traps and then we wait for their owners to come pick up later in the day. And that's about it. Beautiful white whiskers too. Get that belly. Oh, keep that little spotted belly. Right How long have you been volunteering here? Uh, I've been here since the beginning of summer, Usually. last summer, so oh. 2015. But I'm a college student, so I just come here when I'm on break. Well, where do you go to college? Uh, I go to Cornell in Ithaca, New York. Oh, that has one of the great veterinary colleges of yeah. America. Yeah, I'm hoping to hoping to go to vet school, but... Excellent. I just retired, and I've been about six months, but I've been bringing cats for like a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Trapping. Mm -hmm. And are you both cat owners, too? Yes. I have two that I'm trying to tame down. They're almost tamed down. And... Um, one male that was came to this clinic years ago, mm -hmm. and he's totally tamed down now. He's like the love of my life. And then another very elderly cat. Uh -huh. So I have four total. Yep. And just, dogs. Mm -hmm. And birds. <laughs> <laughs> and a husband. Cats, yeah. And a daughter. And a snake. Yes. And kids. So but I love cats. In correlation with an invigorated critique of inequity that was resounding throughout the globe in the 1970s, Peter Singer's publication of Animal Liberation initiated a lively debate on the rights of non-human animals. For example, 
Carrie Wolf criticizes the humanism of Singer's utilitarian approach. Wolf argues that when animal rights are viewed from humanist perspectives, animals are inevitably anthropomorphized and often subsequently characterized as inferior. So the reason you need a post-humanist rather than humanist framework that you find in the rights discourse is to say, look, the reason we should care about animals and treat animals well and expand the moral community is not because all of these different creatures in the world are like us. What, what's beautiful and worthy of respect is that they're not like us. You know, there are different ways of being in the world that, that just like our way of being in the world, deserve to be protected, you know, from exploitation, protected from cruelty, allowed to flourish, and so on and so forth. Giorgio Agamben joins the conversation by asserting that, for thousands of years, political systems have disciplined the minds and bodies of humans to the point where people feel inhuman without them. So the mistreatment and exploitation of non-human animals is based in the idea that they have no comparable political lives. And Agamben calls for equitable social systems that respect the rights of all species. One primary objection to the trap-neuter-return model of managing feral cats is that it is inhumane to allow the cats to live such hard, dangerous lives. Accordingly, feral cats that can't be socialized need to be trapped and euthanized. It sounds like a good idea, but a well-known animal rights group is completely against it. PETA wrote in to Pima County's Board of Supervisors urging them to vote against a proposal that would trap, neuter, and return feral cats rather than euthanize them. Against the urges, the board voted in favor of this feral cat reduction program. Now your side, Simone de Rosario joins us with this controversial motion, really pitting animal lovers against each other, Simone. Stella, the project will put $1.5 million into trapping and sterilizing feral cats in the county, then returning them to wherever they were found. Today, the board unanimously approved it, but PETA is worried that action is sending a dangerous message to the public. Trap, neuter, return. A movement gaining ground all over the country, getting a big win here in Pima County. This is really, really an important move forward for Tucson. Nationwide nonprofit Best Friends is teaming up with Pima Animal Care Center to sterilize 15,000 cats over the next three years. I know they are totally ready to hit the ground running. We're ready to hit the ground running. And when they do, Pima County expects the number of cats being euthanized will go down 30 percent. But PETA tells Nine on Your Side euthanasia is preferable to treating and returning sterilized cats to the street. They're not not dying because you leave them on the street. They're just dying painfully rather than humanely. Opponents to TNR say cats are not meant to survive outdoors. They prey on wildlife and say cat communities send the message that it's okay for humans to abandon their pets. At the end of the day, though, Pima County supervisors have the final say. I think that we as a community have evolved beyond a euthanasia-only option. And those four TNR rejoice. Yeah, the, the suggestion that uh, feral cats have a rough existence uh, is legitimate. Uh, they actually, in my view, deserve to be in somebody's loving home. They, de they deserve to be in a lap, uh, to be petted, and to show their, their joy of the moment by purring and, uh, and pawing you and basically telling you how much they love you. That, that's the best world uh, for companion animals. I, I, I would love that for all cats. But these cats have been abandoned. These cats have been left to fend for themselves. And these cats are trying to survive. And just like a homeless person, it's not a perfect world out there. You do not ever condone, I, I would hope nobody would ever think it would be legitimate to round up homeless people because they don't have a home and bring them into some sort of a shelter for the purpose of ending their life. How outrageous is that? I think it is equally outrageous to talk about doing that to an outdoor cat. These cats have done no wrong. These cats are trying to survive. Yes, should they be socialized? I think they should be. Should they be 
uh, fixed so that they can't reproduce and add to the uh, number of animals that are out there that are trying to fend for themselves. I think that's absolutely a humane idea. But the idea that we should use death as a management tool to basically provide a balance that's artificial from its very concept. We have enough violence in our society today without embracing more violence and, and more tragedy and more euthanasia and, and saying that it's done for the animal's best interest. That's a bunch of hooey. These animals don't want to die. If you see an animal in a shelter, they are in a panic. They are just doing everything in their being to basically fight for the opportunity to exist. And then when we try to give them a painless death, it is torture. This is cruelty. This is something that society should not only uh, shun, but should never have tolerated. We, we should stand up and say, this is outrageous and we're not gonna put it up with it any longer. The other major objection to managed feral cat colonies is that cats are a non-indigenous species that kill birds and small mammals. This argument gained particular purchase in 2013 when a study by the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was released. According to a new study, domesticated cats are killing more animals than previously thought. Estimates say that domesticated cats, including house pets and feral or stray cats, are responsible for the death of billions of birds and small mammals. Scientists, conservationists, and bird watchers are increasingly voicing concern over a problem that many people do not know even exists the impact of free-roaming cats on our songbird populations. Feral cats have an impact on native North American wildlife through a variety of roles. One is as a predator. They may be a predator, um, eat um, songbirds, ground nesting birds, snakes, frogs, and small mammals. There is no location on the globe which attract as, as many bird watchers on an annual basis as Texas. And yet, we've not yet grasped the fact that not only is this predation a threat to the species involved, but it's also a threat economically where birding has become such a central part of the economy, particularly in the southern part of our state. The Smithsonian Cat Predation Study has been thoroughly assessed, and critics have organized enough evidence to invalidate its figures on the number of birds that are killed by free-ranging cats. And an important overall critique of the study is its characterization of domestic cats as a non-native invasive species. Now, some people will say, but they're non-indigenous. Hey, guys, we're non-indigenous. In San Francisco, we used to be a city of seven sand dunes. We used to have the largest population of grizzly bears in California. We don't have the grizzly bears anymore, and it wasn't because of feral cats. We don't have dinosaurs anymore, and it wasn't because of feral cats. To basically villainize outdoor cats, free-roaming cats, and put all the blame on them is crazy. There is no justification for this. When I think of San Francisco and I think of Golden Gate Park and the rhododendron gardens, those rhododendrons are not indigenous to the San Francisco sand dunes, guys. And if we're going to talk about environmental degradation, it's all on two legs, not on four. You know, the birds that are dying in Golden Gate Park aren't because of feral cat colonies. They're dying because we've taken away the brush, which was being used as hiding places uh, for homeless people. It, it's because we have put out pesticides to basically make our flowers grow. It's because we put out rat poison to kill the rats that we decide that are, are no longer appropriate for our community. It's not the feral cats that's causing this environmental degradation. It's all on two legs. It's pollution, it's the damaging of, of habitat, and it's basically the destruction that our species has done to the ecosystem that we coexist in. To blame the feral cats as villainizing a species that deserves none of it. It's wrong. It should stop. In an interview for the Maddie's Fund website, Dr. Julie Levy defines a feral cat as any unsocialized, unowned cat whose temperament makes it afraid of people. Feral cats don't fit the companion animal paradigm. They're a hybrid, 
that falls somewhere between a domestic cat and wildlife, which makes them second-class citizens. Dr. Levy's characterization of feral cats as hybrids corresponds with the influential theories of anthropologist Mary Douglas. She recognized that cultures create meaningful categories for the creatures and things around them. Anything that doesn't specifically fit within a category is an anomaly, a hybrid, that becomes infused with symbolic meaning. Accordingly, hybrids can be feared and detested, and societies often deal with them through extermination. I love the cats. I'm a cat person. So when I found out there were daddy cats right now, then I just I was blown away, and I didn't even notice them until right now. I think that's really cool. So yeah, it's sad if they're trying to get rid of them. Jetty cats. We don't call it jetty cats, me and my husband. We call it cat rocks. That's what we call it. I love it here because I have a fascination for cats. I think they're so spiritual. I like their agility. I like everything they can do. They can survive on their own. And um, I think it's beautiful them walking through the rocks and just all different colors. I don't remember seeing this as a little girl, but since I've gotten married in 2000, I've been noticing more and more and more. And I like it, especially at night when they're walking around. It's also educational because I didn't know that skunks and cats get along. <laughs> it's fun for me. The jetty cats are fortunate because their long established colony is in a picturesque seaside location where people come to enjoy leisure activities and the scenery. The climate is mild, the ocean air is fresh, the sunsets are stunning. And since Audrey Stratton began managing the colony eight years ago, many visitors view the healthy jetty cats as little celebrities. Feral cat colonies throughout the United States and around the globe aren't necessarily located in such prime real estate, but they're all entitled to managed care. And as we saw, there's a global-wide increase in the trap, neuter, return management of feral cats. But there's strong opposition as well. A recent example is Australia, where domestic cats are defined as a non-native invasive species. And in 2015, the government declared that it would exterminate two million feral cats over the next five years. So if you live in Australia and love cats, you might get really sad after hearing this because Australia just declared war on feral cats with brand new environment minister Greg Hunt saying two million of them will be killed to save threatened wildlife. This culling plan has been met with outrage from people in Australia and people throughout the world. Morrissey called the government essentially a committee of sheep farmers who have zero concerns about animal welfare. The cats are, in fact, two million smaller versions of Cecil the lion. Bridget Bardot called it animal genocide. Your country is sullied by the blood of millions of innocent animals, so please don't add cats to this morbid record. A final word on the issue from the father of the no-kill movement. Maybe with the beginning of the no-kill movement and the acceptance of the idea that we don't use management to kill feral cats or any other kind of uh, wildlife population, maybe we can actually come to a time when we respect our own species, reject violence, and actually have peace on Earth.
Look. You can see my hand through it. 